Hello everyone, welcome to Anjum's audiobook library. Today I will read Kafka on the Shore by Haruki Murakami. Chapter 1 The Boy Named Crow So you are all set for money then? The boy named Crow asks in his typical sluggish voice. The kind of voice like when you are just waken up and your mouth still feels heavy and dull. But he is ju- he's just pretending. He is totally awoke, as always. I nod. How much? I reviewed the numbers in my head. Close to, close to 3500 in cash, plus some money I can get from an ATM. I know it's not a lot, but it should be enough for the time being. Not bad, the boy named Crow says, for the time being. I give him another nod. I'm guessing this isn't Christmas money from Santa Claus. Yeah, you're right, I am. I reply. Crow smirks and looks around. I imagine you have started by rifling dryers, am I right? I don't say anything. He knows whose money we are talking about. So there is no need for any long-winded interrogation. He is just giving me a hard time. No matter, Crow says. You really need this money and you are going to get it, big, borrow or steal. It's your father's money, so who cares, right? Get your hands on that much and you should be able to make it, for the time being. But what's the plan after it's all gone? Money isn't like mushrooms in a forest. It doesn't it doesn't just pop up on its own, you know. You will need to eat, a place to sleep. One day you are going to run out. I'll think about that when the time comes, I say. When the time comes, Crow repeats, as if waiting this words in his head in his hand, I nod. Like by getting a job or something? Maybe, I say. Crow shakes his head. You know, you have got a lot to learn about the world. Listen, what kind of job could a 15-year-old kid get in some far-off place he never been to before? You haven't even finished junior high. Who do you think going to going to hire you? I blush a little. It doesn't take much to, much to make me blush. Forget it, he says. You are just getting started and I shouldn't lay all this depressing stuff on you. You have already decided what you are going to do and all that's left is to set the wheels in motion. I mean, it's your life. Basically, you gotta go with what you think is right. That's right. When all is said and done, it's my life. I will tell you one thing though. You are going to have to get a lot tougher if you want to make it. I am trying my best, I say. I'm sure you are, Crow says. This last few years you have gotten a whole lot stronger. I have got to hand it to you. I nod again. But let's face it, you're only 15, Crow goes on. Your life's just begun and there's ton of ton of things out in the world you have never laid eyes on, things you never could imagine. As always, we are sitting beside each other on the old sofa in my father's study. Crow loves the study and all the little objects scattered around there. Now he's toying with a B-shaped glass paperweight. If my father was at home, you can bet Crow would never go anywhere near it. But I have to get out of here, I tell him. No two ways around it. Yeah, I guess you are right. He places the paperweight back on the table and links his hands behind his head. Not that running away going to solve everything. I don't want to rain on your parade or, or anything. But I wouldn't count on escaping this place if I were you. No matter how far you run, distance might not solve anything. The boy named Crow lets out a sigh. Then rest a fingertip on each of his closed eyelids and speaks to me from the darkness within. How about we play our game? He says. All right, I say. I close my eye and quietly take a deep breath. Okay, picture a terrible sandstorm, he says. Get everything else out of your hand. I do what he says. Get everything else out of my head. 
I forget who I am, even I'm totally blank, then things start to surface. Things that as we sit here on the old leather sofa in my father's study, both of us can see. Sometimes fate is like a small sandstorm that keeps changing direction, Crow says. Sometimes fate is like a small sandstorm that keeps changing directions. You change direction but the sandstorm chases you. You turn again but the storm adjusts. Over and over you play this out like some ominous dance with death just before dawn. Why? Because this storm isn't something that blew in from far away. Something that has nothing to do with you. This storm is you. Something inside of you. So all you can do is give into it. Step right inside the storm, closing your eyes and plugging up your ears so the sand doesn't get in and walk through it step by step. There is no sun there, no moon, no direction, no sense of time. Just fine white sand swirling up into the sky like pulverized bones. That's the kind of sandstorm you need to imagine. And that's exactly what I do. I imagine a white funnel stretching up vertically like a thick rope. My eyes are closed tight, hands cupped over my ears, so those fine grains of sand can't blow inside me. The sandstorm draws steadily closer. I can feel the air pressing on my skin. It really is going to swallow me up. The boy called Crow softly rest a hand on my shoulder, and with that the storm vanishes. From now on, no matter what, you have got to be the world's toughest 15-year-old. That's the only way you are going to survive, and in order to do that, you have got to figure out what it means to be tough. You following me? I keep my eyes closed and don't reply. I just want to sink off into sleep like this, his hand on my shoulder. I feel the faint flutter of wings. You are going to be the world's toughest 15-year-old, Crow whispers as I try to fall asleep. Like he was carving the word in a, in a deep blue tattoo on my heart. And you really will have to make it through that violent metaphysical symbolic storm. No matter how metaphysical or symbolic it might be, make no mistake about it. It will cut through flesh like a thousand razor blades. People will bleed there and you will bleed too. Hot red blood. You will catch that blood in your hand, your own blood and the blood of others. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure. In fact, whether the storm is really over, but one thing is certain, when you come uh, come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what this storm's all about. On my 15th birthday, I will run away from home, journey to a far off town, a leave in a corner of small library. It would take a week to go on to the whole thing all the details so i will just keep the main point on my 15th birthday i will run away from home journey to a far off town and live in a corner of a small library it sounds like little like a fairy tale but it's no fairy tale believe me no matter what sort of spin you put on it chapter one cash isn't the only thing i take from my father's study when i leave home I take a small old gold slider. I like the design and feel of it, and a folding knife with a really sharp blade, made to skin deer. It has a 5 inch blade and a nice heft, probably something he bought on one of his trips abroad. I also take a sturdy, bright pocket flashlight out of a drawer, plus sky blue Revo sunglasses to disguise my age. I think about taking my father's favorite Sea Dweller Oyster Rolex. It's a beautiful watch. But something flashy will only attract attention. My cheap plastic Casey watch will, with an alarm and stopwatch, will do just fine and might actually be more useful. Reluctantly, I return the Rolex to its dryer. 
From the back of another drawer, I take out a photo of me and my older sister when we were little. The two of us on a beach somewhere with greens plastered across our faces. My sister's looking off to the side so half her face is shadow and her smile is neatly cut in half. It's like one of those Greek tragedy masks in a textbook that's half one idea and half the opposite. Light and dark, hope and despair, laughter and sadness, trust and loneliness. For my part, I'm staring straight ahead, undaunted at the camera. Nobody else is there at the beach. My sister and I have on swimsuits, here a, here a red floral print one piece, mine some baggy old blue trunks, I'm holding a plastic stick in my hand, white foam is washing over our feet, who took this and where and when, I have no clue, and how could I have looked so happy and why did my father keep just that one photo, the whole thing is a total mystery. I must have been three, my sister nine. Did we ever really get along that well? I have no memory of ever going to the beach with my family. No memory of going anywhere with them, no matter though. There is no way I am going to leave that photo with my father, so I put it in my wallet. I don't have any photos of my mother. My father threw them all away. After giving it some thought, I decide to take the cell phone with me. Once he finds out I have taken it, my father will probably get the phone company to cut off service. Still, I toss it into my backpack, along with the adapter. Doesn't add much weight, so why not? When it doesn't work anymore, I'll just chuck it. Just the bare necessities. That's all I need. Closing with clothes to take is the hardest thing. I will need a couple sweaters and pairs of underwear. But what about shirts and trousers, gloves, mufflers, shorts, a coat? There is no end to it. One thing I do know though, I don't want to wander around some strange place with a huge backpack that screams out, Hey everybody, check out the runaway. Do that and someone is sure to sit up and take notice. Next thing you know, the police will haul me in and I will be sent straight home. If I don't wind up in some gang first. Any place cold is definitely out, I decide. Easy enough, just choose the opposite, a warm place. Then I can leave the coat and gloves behind and get by the half of half the clothes. I pick out wash and wear type things, the lightest ones I have. Fold them neatly and stuff them in my backpack. I also pack a three-season sleeping bag, the kind that rolls up nice and tight. Toilet stuff, a rain, poncho, notebook, a pen, a Walkman and 10 discs. Got to have my music along with this spare rechargeable battery. That's about it. No need for any cooking gear, which is too heavy heavy and takes up too much room since I can buy food at the local convenience store. It takes a while but I am able to subtract, subtract a lot of things from my list. I add things, cross them off and then add a whole other bunch and cross them off too. My 15th, 15th birthday, 15th birthday is the ideal time to run away from home. Any earlier and it would be too soon, any later and I would have missed my chance. During my first two years in junior high, I worked out, training myself for this day. I started practicing judo in the first couple year of grade school and still went sometimes in junior high, but I didn't join any school terms. Whenever I had the time, I would jog around the school ground, swim or go to the local gym. The young trainers there give me free lessons, showing me the best kind of stretching exercise and how to use fitness machines to bulk up. They taught me which muscles you use every day and which one can only be built up with machines. Even, even the correct way to do a bench press, I'm pretty tall to begin with and will, with all the exercise, exercise I have developed pretty broad shoulder and pecs. Most strangers would take me for 17. If I run away looking my actual age, actual age, you can imagine all the problems that would cause. 
other than the trainers at the gym and housekeeper who comes to our house every other day and of course the bare minimum required to get by at school. I barely talk to anyone. For a long time my father and I have avoided seeing each other. We live under the same roof but our schedules are totally different. He spends most of his time in his studio far away and I do my best to avoid him. The school I'm going is a private junior high for kids who are upper class or at least rich. It's a kind of school where unless you really blow it, you're automatically promoted to the high school on the same campus. All the students dress neatly, have nice straight teeth and are boring as hell. Naturally, I have zero friends. I have built a well around, wall around me, never letting anybody inside and trying not to venture outside myself. Who could like somebody that like? Who could like somebody like that? They all keep an eye on me from a distance. They might hate me or even be afraid of me. But I'm just glad they didn't bother me because I had tons of things to take care of, including spending a lot of my free time devouring books in the school library. I always paid close attention to what was said in class though, just like the boy named Crow suggested. The facts and techniques or whatever they teach you in class isn't going to be very useful in the real world, that's for sure. Let's face it, teachers are basically a bunch of morons, but you have got to remember this, you're running away from home, you probably won't have any chance to go to school anymore, so like it or not, you, you had better absorb whatever you can while you have got the chance. Become like a sheet of blotting paper and soak it all in. Later on, you can figure out what to keep and what to unload. I did what he said, like almost I always do. My brain like a sponge, I focused on every word said in class and let it all sink in, figured out what it meant and committed everything to memory. Thanks to this, I barely had to study outside of class but always came out near the top on exams. My muscles are getting hard as steel, even as I grew more withdrawn and quiet. I tried hard to keep my emotions from showing so that no one classmates and teachers alike had a clue what I was thinking. Soon I would be launched into the rough adult world, and I knew I'd, I had have to tougher than anybody if I wanted to survive. My eyes in a mirror are cold as a lizard's, my expression fixed and unreadable. I can't remember the last time I laughed or even showed a hint of smile to other people, even to myself. I'm not trying to imply I can keep up this silent, isolated facade all the time. Sometimes the wall I've erected around me comes crumbling down. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes, before I even realize what's going on, there I am, naked and defenseless and totally confused. At times like that I always feel an omen calling out to me, like a dark, omnipresent pool of water. A dark, omnipresent pool of water. I, it was probably always there, hidden away somewhere, but when the time comes, it silently rushes out, chilling every cell in your body. You drown in that cruel flood, grasping for breath. You cling to a vent near the ceiling, struggling, but the air you manage to breathe is dry and burns your throat. Water and thirst, cold and heat, the supposedly opposite elements combine to assault you. The world is a, is a huge space, but the space that will take you in, and it doesn't have to be very big, is nowhere to be found. You seek a voice. But what do you get? Silence. You look for silence, but guess what? All you hear over and over and over is the voice of this woman. And sometimes this prophetic voice pushes a secret switch hidden deep inside your brain. Your heart is like a great river after a long spell of rain, spilling over its banks. All signposts that once stood on the ground are gone, in, inundated and carried away by the rush of water, and still the rain beats down on the surface of the river. Every time you see a flood like that on the news, you tell yourself, that's it, that's my heart. 
Before running away from home, I wash my hands and face, trim my nails, squat. Swab out my ears and brush my teeth. I take my time, making sure my whole body well scrubbed. Being really clean is sometimes the most important thing there is. I gaze carefully at my face at in the mirror. Jeans I have gotten from my father and mother. Not that I have any recollection of what she looked like created this face. I can do my best not to tell any emotions. Show keep my eyes from revealing anything. Bulk up my muscles, but there's not much I can do about my looks. I'm stuck with my father's long, thick eyebrows and the deep lines between them. I could probably kill him if I wanted to. I'm sure, strong enough, and I can erase my fa- mother from my memory. But there is no way to erase the DNA they play they passed down to me. If I wanted to drive that away, I'd have to get rid of me. That's the omen contained in that, a mechanism buried inside of me, a mechanism buried inside of you. I switched off the light and leave the bedroom. A heavy, damp stillness lies over the house. The whispers of people who don't exist, the breath of the death. I look around, standing stock still, and take a deep breath. The clock shows 3 p.m. The two hands cold and distant. They are pretending to be non-comico, non-comital, but I know they are not on my side. It's nearly time for me to say goodbye. I pick up my backpack and slip it over my shoulders. I have carried it any number of times, but now it feels so much heavier. Shikoku, I decide. That's where I'll go. There is no particular reason it has to be Shikoku. Only that starting. The map I got the feeling that's where I should head. The more I look at the map, actually every time I, st- I study it, the more I feel Shikoku tugging at me. It's far south of Tokyo, separated from the mainland by water with a warm climate. I've never been there, have no friends or relatives there. So if somebody started looking for me, which I kind of doubt, Shikoku would be the last place they'd think of. I pick up the ticket I had reserved at the counter and climb aboard the night bus. That's the cheapest way to get to Takamatsu, just a shade over 90 bucks. Nobody pays me any attention, asks how old I am or gives me a second look. The bus driver mechanically checks my checks my ticket. Only a third of the seats are taken. Most passengers are traveling alone, like me, and the bus is strangely silent. It's a long trip to Takamatsu, ten hours according to the schedule, and we'll be arriving early in the morning. But I don't mind. I have got plenty of time. The bus pulls out of the station at eight, and I push my seat back. No sooner do I settle down than my consciousness, like a battery, that. That's lost its charge, starts to fade away, and I fall asleep. Sometime in the middle of night, a hard rain begins to fall. I wake up every once in a while. Part the chintzy curtain at the window and gaze out at the highway rushing by. Raindrops beat against the glass, blurring street lights alongside the road that stretch off. Into the distance, at identical intervals, like they were set down to measure the earth, a new light rushed up close, and an instant fades off behind us. I check my watch and see it's past midnight. Automatically shoved off, shoved to the front, my fifteenth birthday makes its appearance. Hey, happy birthday! The boy named Crow says. Thanks, I reply. The omen is, is still with me, though like a shadow. I check to make sure the wall around me is still in place. Then I close the curtain and fall back asleep.